thank you, uh, Aron, and thank you for coming back for part two. Um, I'm just going to, I was going to put a recap here of uh, part one, just so we all have a running start at what I want to do today. So the, the uh, one sentence summary of yesterday's talk is, if uh, R is a complete, and this is the important word in this sentence, complete local ring, then it satisfies the Kroll-Rimach-Schmidt property. In other words, direct decompositions of finitely generated modules are essentially unique up to permuting the factors. And today, I want to discuss how bad can it get for non-complete rings? So uh, for example, here are some questions to guide us. Could we have, um, let's say, indecomposables A and B and C and D so that A directs some B is isomorphic to C directs some D, but not any of the pairwise ones. Uh, obviously, yes, because this is an essential. This, if this never happened, then all of the rings would satisfy Carl Schmidt. Could we have um, slightly worse? Could we have A plus B isomorphic to C plus D plus E? Again, indecomposables. So here I'm saying that the number of indecomposable summands on each side. Could we have um, indecomposables A and B so that two copies of A is isomorphic to three copies of B? Could we have, oh, I had a couple more I wanted to mention. Could we have uh, A indecomposable so that A is indecomposable, A two direct two sum, a direct sum of two copies of A, direct sum of three copies of A, and so on up to say a direct sum of 72 copies of A, so that these all have only the expected decompositions. These all have only these decompositions as written. But when you get to 73, that decomposes into, say, indecomposables. Or finally, one last one to guide us, could we have um, infinitely many indecomposables Let's call them, say, AI, so that AI divides M for all I. Remember, this is my notation for uh, is isomorphic to a direct sum, sum and of. So these are all possible uh, descriptions of failure of Kroll Schmidt. And the interesting thing is that some of them can happen and some of them can't, and it's not 100% clear 
from the beginning, which ones are worse? So just for example, uh, I'll, I'll say how about some colored chalk. This one, obviously, we said yes. This one, yes. This one, no, this one can't happen. Though you wouldn't think to look at it that it looks any worse than one of these. Uh, this one, yes, this terrible thing can happen. But this one, no. So let's discuss uh, what structure is in place that allows the yeses and prevents the noes. So our strategy for this is to compare mod r and mod r hat, where, so set the notation for the rest of the day, the rest of the lecture. Rm is a local ring, Noetherian always, with m adic completion r hat. This is an obvious uh, thing to do since we understand the module theory over the complete local ring. Additionally, we're going to use uh, the semi-group structure on these two module classes, categories. So what do I mean by module structure, or semi-group structure? So you can define m plus n, well, to be just m plus n. So we add, I'm going to be very uh, um, sloppy, I guess, about um, isomorphism classes of modules versus the actual modules themselves, and uh, when we think of this as a category versus when we think of it as a semigroup. It will always be a semigroup, is the short version. So, make sure I don't leave anything out. Yeah. Some first observations. The first is, as a semigroup, mod r hat is free. It has no relations. Specifically, it has a, a basis consisting of the indecomposable modules. So another way to write that is that mod r hat is isomorphic as a semigroup to the natural numbers, some huge direct sum of copies of the natural numbers indexed by, so the index set i consists of isomorphism classes of indecomposables. Secondly, natural map
from mod r to mod r hat, where you just take a module and complete it, or if you prefer tensor with the completion, same thing, is a semigroup homomorphism. That's just to say that m direct sum n hat is isomorphic to the direct sum of the hats. So that's not complicated. Third, If you complete two modules and they become isomorphic upstairs over our hat, then they were isomorphic before. This is a version of faithfully flat descent, I think probably first in EGA, maybe. Also, there's a very nice proof due to Bob Goralnik. So, in particular, that means this map is injective. But it's actually better than that. It's what's called a divisor homomorphism. Of semigroups, which let me tell you what that is. Oh, whoops, I, I left one out. Well, I'll come back. It's a divisor homomorphism of semigroups, meaning if M direct sum, no, let me write it like this, sorry. If M hat divides N hat, that is, after passing to the completion, M is isomorphic to a direct sum end of N, then M was already a direct sum end of M. And this, in fact, is, is in the same place. And finally, the, as a last preliminary fact, in particular, Mod R is what's called a cancellative semigroup. So if M direct sum X is isomorphic to M direct sum Y, then insert here a short proof, which I won't write down, pass to the completion, use the fact that you can cancel over the completion with the, uh, um, the Kroll-Schmidt property over the completion, and then descend back down, then x was isomorphic to y. So this semigroup homomorphism from mod r into a free one is not just any old homomorphism, it's a very particular kind. And this already allows us to rule out one of the kinds of bad behavior. We cannot have
this sort of behavior. Two uh, copies of A isomorphic to three copies of B for indecomposables. A and B. So let's talk about why. If we had this, then of course we complete, we get the same thing with hats. And this is happening in mod r hat. Sorry, Dale, is that in the way? Which, remember, we can think of as just vectors of natural numbers. Well, vectors indexed by some probably enormous index set. But as such, it has a natural partial order. In the component-wise partial order, two copies of this one is equal to three copies of that one. That means this one must be bigger in every component. So I warned you that I was going to be sloppy and go back and forth between module categories and semigroups. This is a thing that makes no sense, of course, for modules, but in that free semigroup it makes sense. Every component of A hat is bigger than every component of B hat. But in a free semigroup with a basis, this means we must have divisibility hat must be isomorphic to a direct sum and of a hat. And then we can descend. Oops, there we go. If b hat is a sum and of a hat, then b is a sum and of a, but they're both indecomposable. So b is isomorphic to a. And this equation then says two copies of a isomorphic to three copies of a but we can cancel. I'll put it up here. And so A had to be zero, which I guess maybe zero is indecomposable, so that qualifies. All right. So I said in general this index set I is enormous. Probably uncountable, maybe even worse. To localize the problem, to make the problem smaller and more manageable, let's consider a single module. And uh, I think Jan used this notation yesterday. Add M with a lowercase. All of my uh, categories are lowercase categories. So this is the direct sum ends. of direct sums of copies of M. Then of course we get the restriction 
of our semigroup map restricts to a map of these semigroups, add m. Of course, it's still a semigroup. Take any two things in there and add them together. You get another one. But this, what is this? Over the completion, we have Carl Schmidt. This is a direct sum of indecomposables in a unique way. So this is a free semigroup of finite rank. So to summarize, this add m admits a divisor homomorphism. It's the restriction of a divisor homomorphism. into a free semigroup of finite rank. Now again, this already rules out another possibility. So let me explain what that is. Maybe I'll call this a proposition, which is that add m contains only finitely many. Indecomposables. So the last possible behavior that I mentioned was infinitely many indecomposables dividing M. This can't happen. In particular, M itself has only finitely many direct sum decompositions. Now, I thought I might prove this, but let me just um, give a sketch which points out the essential, the essential result that you use to prove this. So, right, so to be, uh, <coughs> though I guess it, it's, it's actually, it's literally true as I've written it, though a little bit dumb. Uh, what you probably should say is only finitely many decompositions up to permuting the factors. But if there are only finitely many up to permuting the factors, there are only finitely many permutations, so it's the same. It's a different number, but it's the same. So let's just consider add m, just to consider it as a sub semigroup of n to the n. And if we have some, let's say, L in add m, so this means L is a sum and of a direct sum of copies of m, let's write L equals, this is terrible, terrible notation, you should never do this, L is a vector of length n. <laughs> now, we again use the component-wise 
partial order. on this free semigroup and observe that if L is indecomposable, then this vector is a minimal element of the sub semigroup add M. This is by the cancellation property and vice versa. That if you have a minimal element, it must be indecomposable. That's probably even easier to see. So indecomposables correspond to or are minimal elements of this uh, of this sub semigroup and now we use Dixon's lemma which says a sub semigroup well this is the case of Dixon's lemma I need a sub semigroup of a free semigroup has only finitely many what are called clutters. And I'll define that. That is subsets having no comparable elements. Is that what I mean? Every clutter is, yes, that is what I mean. That's not what I've written though, is it? Let's, thanks, let's try to fix that. A, yeah, so the, the sentence got kind of morbled. I meant to say a clutter in a sub semi group. Everybody, no, that didn't work. Let's try again. <laughs> Sorry, it says that a clutter, which again is a subset with no comparable elements, in a sub semi group of a free one. is free, or is finite. So since we know that indecomposables match with minimal elements, you can have only finitely many minimal elements by Dixon's lemma. They form a clutter. And so you have only finitely many indecomposables. And that's the proof. Thanks for the assist. So what we've seen so far is that this semigroup point of view puts fairly strict conditions on ad m and on mod r. So the fact that mod r, that's the big one, and add m, that's the small finite one, are, this is a word I learned this morning at breakfast, divisor closed sub semigroups of a free semigroup, or of two different free semigroups, divisor closed means they admit a divisor homomorphism into the free one, puts restrictions 
on the awfulness that they can attain. But there are still some pretty bad semigroups out there, even divisor closed ones. So let's look at a, an example of a slightly bad one. So let's look. So we're leaving commutative algebra for a moment and just talk about semigroups. So let's look at S for semigroup. Let's think of it as column vectors of natural numbers so that, let me make sure I get the equation correct. Seventy two X plus Y is equal to seventy three Z. Then I'll leave it to you to check that this inclusion of S into N three is a divisor homomorphism. So it's, this is a divisor closed sub semigroup. Then what are the minimal elements Well, there's one sort of obvious one. There's one 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 Then there's I'll do them in the right order so I don't get muddled later There is zero seventy three one And there is seventy three zero seventy two. And maybe we call these A, B, and C. Then A is minimal. Two copies of A, well, that's just A plus A. That's the only way to write this in terms of the minimal elements. Three copies of A also, that's the only way to write this in terms of the minimal elements. 72 copies of A. That's the only way to write this, but 73A, if I've done this correct, is B plus C. So this should be reminiscent of a one of the questions we asked at the beginning, can you have behavior kind of like this for modules? Can you have an indecomposable so that you take direct sums of it with itself, you get only the expected decompositions until some point something bad happens? And what we see now is that at least the semigroup structure doesn't rule that out. don't know yet is whether this can actually be realized. Can this semigroup or any other be realized as well either mod R or Add M for some ring N 
in some module M. And that's the last thing I'll discuss today. And I'll continue discussing it tomorrow, I believe. I don't think I'll get close to done today. Modi said we shouldn't keep the audience in suspense, so I'll just... Yes. <laughs> yes, we can. Even over a one-dimensional domain R. So you can build a ring R and a module M to reflect this behavior, and you don't even have to build a very big, complicated ring. No, it's a little complicated, but it's not very big. So to discuss why this is true, there are two main ingredients. First, we need to control which R hat modules are extended from R. And let me say just a little more before I, this is too vague to be useful. So I mean, the behavior of their ranks after localizing at minimal primes of our hat holds the key. And step two, once you've done that, is to build modules with very weird behavior at the minimal primes. You can do that, you can realize these semigroups. So let me now hmm. I'll go ahead and state a more precise version of one, and that will probably be it for today. So one is a theorem of a beautiful theorem. of Larry Levy. Oh, whoops, now I've said Larry. Now I have to remember what Odenthal's first name is. Charlie, Charlie. thank you. Char I don't know, can I call him Charlie? I've never met him. Sure. Okay. So, it goes like this. This is from, oh, uh, <laughs> I learned at a, a meeting two weeks ago in Toronto in, in honor of Ragnar Buchweitz that he I don't know why he and I never discussed this, but he was adamant that referring to a year in this format is ridiculous. Hilbert proved things in 1896. Which one are you talking about? Be specific. And Larry Levy wasn't that old, but it, it, you know, sort of close. So it says this. Let's let RM be a one-dimensional, as I foretold, one-dimensional local ring such that the component 
r hat is a reduced ring. Then, a finitely generated R hat module, let's call it N, is extended from R, that is, isomorphic to the completion of some M. if and only if when we localize n, so this is going to happen for all p uh, minimal prime of our hat, when we localize n at a minimal prime of our hat, that localization is a field because our ring is reduced. And we just look at the vector space dimension. But this is equal to the same quantity for all P and Q such that their intersections to R are equal. So they lie over the same minimal prime of the little ring downstairs. And as a consequence, and this will be the last thing I say today, If we are able to build a domain, which I said we were, then all of these uh, intersections down to R are the zero ideal. So this condition has no content. So this says that N is extended if and only if N has constant rank, that is, these vector space dimensions are always equal. So as I said, this will be the last thing I say. Uh, I I'm pretty sure that Nick Baith is going to talk a lot more about the result of Levy and Odenthal and generalizations in his talk on tomorrow. Uh, so come back for more of that. And in my third talk, I will show how to finish part two of our strategy, which is to build a bad ring to which to apply the theorem of Levy and Odenthal. So thanks for your... Uh, yeah, yeah, minimal price, sorry. Thanks. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. <laughs>